So what are the two or three most important lessons from the crowdsource response after the Haiti earthquake? Well, the, the first one, and I think this is the most important one, is that we learned that it actually is possible for individuals to make a useful and meaningful contribution to the process of uh, disaster relief from a long distance away. Uh, you know, the OpenStreetMap project, we had um, hundreds of contributors producing data from the comfort of their own homes um, in places in the United States and Europe particularly, mm -hmm. um, and that was really incredible. Um, and, and I think the second, the second big lesson is that it is possible, although challenging, for uh, large traditional organizations, um, disaster relief agencies and the like, to interface meaningfully with the crowd, as it were, you know, mm -hmm. with, with um, these more informal organizations that are producing information that can be consumed by these larger agencies. Um, and I think that in, in terms of making uh, crowdsourcing a kind of a sustainable uh, addition to uh, the overall disaster relief picture in the future. Um, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done on working out how to kind of synchronize that as sort of impedance mismatch, if you will, how, how to um, make it easier for larger organizations to interface with smaller, more ad hoc organizations and, uh, and uh, make it possible for them to be able to make use of the information that's provided to them. Now, do you think that the, the lessons learned in the execution from Haiti can be applied elsewhere, or was that a unique circumstance that was only really relevant to what happened in Haiti? Well, that's very interesting. You know, I mean, I think, I mean, I think in a way, um, in, I mean, in retrospect, I mean, if, if we look at uh, the way in which, for example, the Ushahidi project was used uh, to geotag and to translate text messages from uh, victims of the earthquake, or the way that OpenStreetMap was used to produce geographic information from satellite imagery, on one hand it seems kind of miraculous, you know, because this is something that is very unprecedented, but if we look at it from the other end, I think that there's a way in which this was sort of historically inevitable. Um, that if you, you know, view this through the lens of the development of things like Wikipedia, um, it, it starts to look kind of inevitable that these uh, techniques for collaborative knowledge production will eventually find all kinds of different outlets, mm -hmm. uh, you know, through which they can um, be a signif significant utility. So I would say, um, I, I mean, I would say that the that the pr that the use of crowdsourcing and humanitarian aid is a logical consequence of those techniques being applied elsewhere, um, rather than necessarily, uh, you know, a possible cause. Sure. Now switching gears a little bit, um, I know you're deeply involved in mapping. So what is the most significant mapping development of, let's say, the last decade or so? What's the thing that just completely opened it up? So this is, this is a really good question, and actually I have a two-part answer for you. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll start with uh, a, a more direct uh, answer, which is within the last 10 years, I have to say, um, probably the, the single most kind of groundbreaking innovation was the development of Google Maps API. Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting, and I, when I say that, I'm actually not referring to Google Maps itself, although I think uh, everyone's experience of Google Maps as being a much more kind of flexible, interactive uh, uh, connection to digital maps, a much more um, interactive interface to digital maps. Um, I think that that was really startling for a lot of people, and being able to see satellite imagery, sure. you know, go and browse your home for the very first time. Right. But, uh, but I would say that far more groundbreaking was actually the underlying JavaScript API that Google opened to allow developers to make applications using Google Maps. Mm -hmm. um, this kind of cracked open what we have sort of taken to calling the field of neo-geography. And it was this tremendous wellspring of interest and excitement mm -hmm. uh, in you know, 2005 and 2006 of people creating these different mashups of you know, various kinds of location information placed onto Google Maps. Um, and it was clear that they had sort of, that the, 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 uh, that the dam had sort of broken, and suddenly it was possible, and this is, the, this is what was really innovative about it, it was really possible for the first time for an ordinary individual, somebody who was not a mapping expert, to put a map on the web, to create a mapping application, to put information on a map in a way that they could then use to tell uh, a narrative to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really quite groundbreaking. But um, I think that there's a certain, there's a certain limited utility uh, to these proprietary mapping APIs. I think that they serve a really valuable function for kind of basic consumer use and even basic commercial use, but there's a wide range of uh, potential uses of maps uh, that the very kind of limited cartography of Google Maps, for example, or the, um, the uh, limited license restrictions of, of the Google Maps API, it just don't quite cover all the possible use cases. And so I think if we were to go a little bit further back and talk about the most significant mapping innovations in the last say 20 years, mm -hmm. um, I would have to say hands down, even more so than the Google Maps API, 
is um, the increased availability of consumer uh, global positioning system receivers. Mm -hmm. um, personal navigation devices um, and uh, you know, GPS receivers for hiking and every, uh, every other kind of thing you can imagine has made it possible for um, ordinary citizens to become, ordinary people to become citizen cartographers, right? Mm -hmm. um, that in a real way, like we no longer have to be surveyors, we no longer have to be mapping experts um, with these devices and the signals that they receive from you know, satellites in orbit, we actually can collect accurate geographic information and then um, apply it to whatever purpose we choose. And I think that that, that, that more than anything else, has, has driven and I think will continue to drive um, the increasing awareness and participation on the part of really everyone in, um, in the space that they live in and in, in being able to develop narratives about that space. So looking forward, what do you see happening in the mapping front over the next two years or so? You know, it's funny, and I, I wish that I had a, a really good answer for that. And and um, all I have is, is a kind of a reflection on where I see us as being right now. Sure. Um, if you think back to, you know, say 2003, I think everyone remembers very clearly the uh, excitement um, that sprang up around uh, the Friendster website, mm -hmm. right? And this was very exciting. It was like, oh, look, here's a website, and I can, uh, you know, connect all of these people and label them as friends, and then there's a web page with little icons of my friends. Yeah. And that was great. Sure, At the time, it was sure. really quite, quite startling right. um, to see all of this in one place. Um, but, but where is Friendster today? Um, and I think that we are at at this kind of place with mapping today. I think we're it's still sort of 2003, mm. and um, I think that we have we people have discovered like oh wow location is really exciting and you know we can put stuff on top of maps and we can you know check into a place and have that broadcast to all of our friends. But what does that mean exactly? Like what utility does that mm -hmm. actually have? And I think as we have seen social networking go from being an object unto itself um, on the world wide web. And, and we've seen that sort of transform into a kind of a leavening that, that mm. is, uh, that's sort of spread across all of our sort of daily activities on the net. Um, I think that we're going to see location do something very similar, where in a lot of ways, I think people still view location and location-based services as an object unto themselves. And I think that we're going to see um, the, the, the use of this technology sort of slowly spread through everything we do um, in a way that will... Well, I don't really know. That's, I guess that's my point. Is sure. I have no idea what, that, what the outcome of that is going to be, but I think right. we're going to see sort of very gradually and bit by bit over the next, say, five years. I mean, that's how long it took to go from Friendster being launched to Facebook having like 100 million users, right? Sure, sure. About five years. Right. And so I think we can expect in the next five years to see the same kind of m massive changes in terms of how location-based technologies are used by ordinary individuals. So the last question I have for you, and it dovetails very much with that, Location, as it's adopted more, also brings with it some privacy questions because you're talking about a physical location of presumably a person. What's your take on where that's at right now? Are we just at the point now where there's an adoption of location services and people aren't as concerned about privacy? Or does our entire notion of what privacy is have to change? Well, so it's interesting that you ask this because I feel like this is actually a question that goes far beyond that of location mm -hmm. technology. Um, I mean, I think you know, in in every possible way, the growth of of um, data gathering technology and more to the point, data storage technology, um, I think has made it possible for uh, minute aspects of our lives, um, both on the internet and outside of the internet, to be um, recorded with or without our knowledge or consent. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so the the adoption of location based technologies is is only sort of one, I think, kind of component of this massive shift that we're seeing, and. Um, you know, inevitably there are going to be, um, you know, these sort of like nightmare stories that come out in the press about how, you know, someone's jilted lover discovered their location because they checked in somewhere on Foursquare sure. and that was how they tracked them down and committed some heinous crime. Sure. Um, and I, obviously that's inevitable, but, and, and this is, I'm speaking not as a technologist, but as an observer of human nature now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel as if we see time and time again how people's principled considerations often give way to um, a willingness to accept compromise in the face of utility. Mm. Uh, and I think that that's what we're going to find with location technology uh, in a lot of ways. There was a website called uh, Fire Eagle, which was launched, uh, was built at uh, Yahoo's Brickhouse Incubator. Mm -hmm. It was launched a few years ago to a fair amount of fanfare, which tragically, much like Friendster, sort of, I mean, I think it's still around. I worked on it. I mean, mm -hmm. I actually, this was something I was very interested in, really quite proud of. And to be honest with you, I don't use it. And I don't know, I'm not sure anybody, who, I don't know of anybody who does use it. And um, 
And again, I think I feel like you know, the whole idea of Fire Eagle was to provide sort of very fine-grained controls over which applications on the internet had access mm -hmm. to your location information, so that you could determine very precisely um, which apps got access to that, and by corollary, who had access to your location or your presence at what precision. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like in some ways it was a solution in search of a problem. And I feel like in some ways people really want the benefits of location-based technology without having to worry too much about the inconveniences of worrying who exactly is tracking that. Right. Um, and I, so I think that our, our notions of privacy ultimately are going to change in the face of technology. And I think that as with all uh, technology-driven cultural changes, um, this will have both its benefits and its detriments. Great. Well, thanks very much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you.